In the United Kingdom, you may eat ducks, chickens, geese, and nah, not these. They all belong to the Queen. Well, all swans in the United Kingdom can belong to the Queen, but she mainly exercises this right on the River Thames. Of course, sorry. My name's David Barber and I look after the swans wherever the Queen exercises her royal prerogative right. It's not a full-time job, although sometimes it feels like a full-time job. Every year, Mr Barber runs a census of the swans for Her Majesty, a bit like an annual checkup. This is called Swan Upping and he does it with a whole crew, like this guy, this guy and this guy. Swan Upping has taken place since the 12th century where swans in those days were actually a very, very important food. Of course, today, swans are a protected species and no longer eaten. We travel in six traditional rowing skiffs from Sunbury on Thames all the way up to Abingdon. And it's about a 79 mile journey. What do we say when we see a swan? Oh. All up, all up. Each family of swans we come across, we will circle the skiffs around them, we will tie the wings in their legs, we will take them ashore, we will weigh them, measure them and check them for any injuries. After we've done that, we will put a ring on them and we will release them back into the river. So if these are the queen swans, where is Her Majesty for all of this? She did come swan up in a few years ago and hopefully she enjoyed it, she seemed to enjoy it but I can't answer for the Queen anyway. I love swans, a royal bird. People here in the United Kingdom, they love them. And you know, I want to make sure that they survive for the future. All right, gents, let's toast. The Queen! The Queen. The Queen. Nothing says Britain more than... Nope. Nope. Keep going. Ah oh, yes, there it is. A nice cup of tea. We know we have China to thank for introducing tea to the Western world. But how did it make its way to England and become the cultural obsession it is today? Well, that's all thanks to one Portuguese woman. The year, 1662. The person? Catherine of Braganza. She had just won the hand of England's King Charles II with the help of a very large dowry, including money, treasures, and spices. This worthwhile trade made her the Queen of England, Scotland, and Ireland. When she arrived to her new homeland, she brought with her packets of loose leaf tea in crates labeled Transport de Ervas Aromaticas. It's a theory that this was later abbreviated to TEA, tea. Now tea could already be found in England, but was only really used for medicinal purposes. Catherine continued drinking tea to her heart's content. Mm. And as the new royal, everything about her, including her beverage habits, was copied by other ladies, desperate to be just like their idol. Another thing Catherine brought to the table from Portugal was the idea of tea drinking experience. She popularized the use of porcelain teacups and mugs by the end of the 17th century, much of British aristocracy were enjoying the hot beverage. Ooh, delightful. And soon enough, so was everyone else. Today, while tea can be found pretty much everywhere, it remains a special daily pastime for the Brits. Mm. So carry on and drink tea, people of England. I think people say I look a bit like a queen in this outfit, yeah. And people call me your majesty. People come up and they curtsy. It's almost like living two lives, really. Let's commence. I'm Ella Slack, and I'm the Queen's stand-in. I've done it for oh, over 30 years now. Anything that the Queen does is rehearsed. If it's just going to a town hall or opening a hospital, I've probably been a stand-in queen definitely more than 50 times. A stand-in is not a look-alike. I don't look like the queen. 
but I'm the same sort of stature and height. I'm about virtually five foot. The Queen's about five foot two, but I live at Royal Court on Queen's Promenade in Royal Ramsey in the Isle of Man. And the Queen lives in Buckingham Palace in London. I drive a Ford Gear automatic car. The Queen has been seen to drive Range Rovers and most of the time she's in a chauffeur-driven car or in a carriage. Well, it started because I was at the BBC and the producer who was doing the cenotaph came to see me and said that the Queen had sent a message to say when she stood at the cenotaph, the sun was in her eyes. And so could we do anything about it? Well, I said to him, would you like me to come and stand in the position for you? Because all the stage managers were six foot men. And then that led on to other things. I went in her royal carriage and rode on the boat up to the Tower of London. And then there will be the state opening of parliament. I've never been allowed to sit on, on the throne in the House of Lords. I have to lurk above it. It's a very strict rule. If I'm in a carriage or a car, I will wave, you know, do like, like that, just like that, like that. The events that I've been helping with are events that are transmitted worldwide and millions of people are going to watch. I look afterwards and watch the programmes going out and I'll see her there and think, I did it for you. Let's say you're in London. You need to get from the London Eye to Buckingham Palace. Taxi! <laughs> Buckingham Palace, please. We would leave on our right Belvedere Road, left Chichely Street, whoa, whoa, right wait. York Road. You know the whole route already. Well, we have to. All London black cab drivers have to have completed the knowledge. We need to know all the streets and roads in London to provide that service. All of them? Oh, OK, let's go see where the Queen lives. London is famous for its black taxis. You need to get to somewhere no sweat because every black cabbie has to pass an insanely hard test known as the knowledge. Like this guy. Hello, my name's Peter Allen. I've been a London taxi driver for nine years. How can I help? The knowledge is the test that you have to pass in order to become a London taxi driver. It's the toughest taxi test in the world. The first thing you have to do is learn what's called the blue book. As a cab driver, it's your Bible. You have to learn 320 routes around London, so that's 640 quarter of a mile areas. You have to learn 25,000 streets and roads within a six mile radius of Trafalgar Square in London. You have to learn every single point of interest, place of interest, apartment buildings, housing estates, police stations, mosques, synagogues, churches. A few moments later. Clothes shop, furniture shop, china shop, nightclub, bars, restaurants, <sighs> everything, anywhere where a paying passenger may want to go. Okay then, let's go to the exam centre. My name is Katie Channels and I'm the Knowledge of London manager. So the exams are several phases of oral appearances. It's basically an interview type situation where you describe the streets and roads, um, attempting to use the shortest distance between point A and point B. So at the beginning we might ask them the name of the theatre, where that theatre is, and by the end of their knowledge we'll expect them to know what is actually showing at that theatre. Whoa. On average, it takes two to four years to learn the knowledge. The best way to study is to go out onto the streets on a scooter. Isn't that right, Abbas? My name is uh, Abbas Akhtar. I've been studying knowledge for about four and a half years now. And my next appearance is in about three weeks' time. It's like a full-time job. You wake up in the morning, go out on your bike a couple of hours, come to the college, study, study, study. Whilst I'm sleeping, I'm studying as well. Yeah. One in five who attempt the knowledge actually pass. That's the same success rate as a US Navy SEAL. GPS and sat-navs are banned in the exam, but why not use them on the streets? My GPS is here, and if we get somewhere and we see a road's closed, we need to say, right, that's closed, but I know that if I go left here, that will take me there. If I go right here, that will take me there. We need to be able to do all that, as well as having a conversation with the person in the back and solving the world's problems at the same time. Leicester Square to Big Ben, please. So you'd leave Leicester Square by Irving Street, turn right into Charing Cross Road, go forward St Martin's Place. Fancy going shopping? 
Stop! No, no, no. No whistling in the Burlington Arcade. Uh, who are you? We are the Burlington Beatles, probably the oldest and smallest police force in the world. You could say that we police your manners. Right. Okay. Well, Mark Lord, head Beatle of the Burlington Arcade, tell us your story. The Beatles story started... Before we get into that, what actually is a Beatle? To be honest with you, I don't think anybody really knows. We predate any police force in the country. Right, back to the story. Go ahead, Mark. The Beatles story started at this arcade. Arcade? Are there games here? No. <laughs> so, it's just like a shopping centre, right? Yes. Okay, third time lucky. Go ahead, Mark. The Beatles story started on the 20th of March, 1819. London was very different. People didn't really trust the water, so they drank either gin or beer, and obviously that leads to a certain type of behaviour. So the Beatles' role really was to keep order within the arcade, and in fact that tradition has carried on right away through to today. Our uniforms um, are made up of several different layers. We first of all put on our waistcoats, then our frock coats and our top hats in the summer or the autumn. In the winter, you will still put on your waistcoat. You will then put on your cape and your top hat. The original rules here were no whistling because the pickpockets would whistle signals to one another. No drunkenness. Play a musical instrument. You're not supposed to hurry. It's ungentlemanlike or unladylike. Carry your own parcels. You mustn't bring a bicycle. And accompanied ladies, by the way, weren't also allowed in. Now, lots of those rules we couldn't enforce today. We still try to enforce the no hurrying. We still try to enforce the no whistling. It's all about behaviour. As long as you're respecting those around you and respecting the arcade, you'll be left alone. And I put this uniform on. I represent nearly 200 years worth of history. It makes me immensely proud. Yeah, I want to stay here till I retire, <laughs> if I'm honest with you. That's absolutely true, by the way. That isn't just the, uh, you know, the spill. So these are jellied eels. Eels in jelly. Jellied eels. And these are eels with no jelly. Like loads of eels, drawers of eels. Hold on to your seats, this might get a bit weird. So, we got this giant jiggly bowl of jelly deals from this guy. My name is John Chilvers. I work for Mixed Eel Supply in Billingsgate Fish Market. We supply live eels to the catering trade, public. I've been selling eels for 33 years since I left school. Right, we've got some lovely eels here. These are all farmed in Holland. But they're like the Rolls Royce of the jelly deals. Yeah, they're very, very slippery, like some of our customers. Back in the 18th century, London's River Thames was crawling with these eels. Nowadays, John is one of the last few eel suppliers in London. So John, why were they so popular? Yeah, you need to speak to one of the older fishmongers for that. Oh, uh, okay then. I'm 72 years old and I eat eels every day. Perfect. So Frank of Bradley's Fish Supply, what made them so popular back then? So those days, it was, it was no-brainer. Everybody ate jelly deals. It was an easy source to get, um, very simple. You put a hook out and they catch themselves. Eels are really edible and they were full of goodness. The people didn't realise it then, but they were. They were, they were eating a real good product. And we didn't have Indian, Chinese, takeaway, kebabs, everything else. So it was a, it was a source of food. So how do you make them? Quite easy to prepare. You to head off, guts out, chop them in pieces, then we cook them. Um, the process of cooking is more of an art. You need them to be very soft. But if you go past being soft, all you've got is mash. Thanks, Frank. So, pie shop owner Kane, what do they go well with? Jelly deals and stew deals are very traditional with pie mash and liquor in the East End of London. So, um, you know, it's not for everybody. The world's changing a little bit. You do either like them or hate them. Probably in the old days, we would go through uh, maybe 50 or 60 bowls of eels a week. Probably now we might do 10 or 12. So if you think about food around the world, you think about Paris and their baguettes, New York, you think about the pizzas, the New York cheesecakes, that's what they're synonymous for. London, the traditional food in London is pie mash and eels. That is our staple diet. And the taste? It's like eating basically a chunky white fish. 
It must be love. It must be love. It must be love. 